Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation Sync Up series, our ongoing series, and tonight our topic is Virtual gig Gigging Best Practices. Um, my name is Reed Wick. I am the Membership and Industry Relations Representative for the Recording Academy, and uh, we're proud to continue to support Sync Up, and I'm honored to be asked to moderate this panel this evening. Um, first, I want to give a shout out to everyone at the Jazz and Heritage Foundation, Don Marshall, and Jason, and Kia, Khalid, the whole crew, for continuing to serve the community in this way. Uh, it's very important to continue to give back to the community and uh, we're appreciative that they're doing that. Um, for tonight, I, we've assembled a really cool panel and I'd like to take a second to introduce the panel. I'm gonna start with the ladies, or the lady. Um, joining us tonight is vocalist uh, Anias St. John. Did I say you incorrectly, hopefully? Anais. Anais St. John. I know I always screw that up, sorry <laughs> about that. Um, one of my favorite musicians in New Orleans, multiple, multiple instrumentalist Don Dappy. Uh, and drummer, band leader of Waterseed, Blue Hill, and a couple of my more production-oriented colleagues, uh, Stuart Raper, and uh, Grammy-winning recording engineer and producer, Chris Finney. So, welcome to our panel. We know you're applauding out in the audience. Um, so, let's get right into it. You know, on March 11th, I had the pleasure of visiting with Scott Roger, who is Paul McCartney's manager, and that morning, he got a call that Paul's European tour was canceled. And I, you know, I asked him, is this coronavirus thing really that serious? And he says, man, I'm telling you, it's gonna be so much worse when it hits the United States. And uh, two days later, a number of us, and I knew you were in the same room with me, we were having this little industry lunch gathering and all of our phones went off at the same time. And it was the announcement that South by Southwest canceled. And I think that's when our entire industry went, oh my God, life is gonna be different, at least for the foreseeable future. And so it really was a defining moment in our music industry at every level, at the local level playing gigs, um, at the national level for touring musicians and everything. So it really has uh, created uh, a lot of mischief in our industry, but it also has created some opportunities for us to do what we are now referring to as the great pivot, right? And so I wanted to kind of start there and ask each of our panelists to kind of start with um, where were you in your career as far as were you on the road? What was going on at that time in March? What were the plans and what was your first reaction when this whole thing hit? And we'll start with ladies with lady first. So maybe you want to give us a, a sense of that? I was booked for about four or five gigs, including French Quarter Fest. Um, and obviously it, it just came out of nowhere. I remember I'm also a school teacher. So I remember sending everyone home and saying goodbye to our students thinking, hey, maybe we'll be back in a couple of weeks. But um, none of us knew at that point how, um, how long this, this goodbye would be. And obviously, everything was canceled, and that was the beginning of a long, long, long summer. <laughs> I can imagine so. Don, how about you? I, when, when it happened, I was, um, I think I was playing a gig, and then uh, I got told, okay, we got to shut down. But that was on March 14th. And, um, but the big picture was uh, the last album I recorded called The Blue Book of Storyville. <laughs> so I got that plug in there. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> it's a good um, record too. It, but it's, the, it's really the first album I've done that got like press all over the world. I mean, front page in The Guardian in London and everything. And I have a record that's kind of a hit and I can't tour. So that's the big deal, not to mention Jazz Fest, the tour to Shanghai, the tour to Denmark, the UK tour, all, all these, you know, everything. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I've heard that story from so many people. You know, I know Papa Grove, John Grove told me the exact same thing. You know, he put out this record he was really proud of, had this whole big tour planned around it and it was all squashed and that story's been told so many times and it's heartbreaking because you all all my friends and it's you know it's hard to hear that uh, so much work and effort and money to make the record and do the promo almost gets flushed down the toilet but you know we're hoping that there'll be an opportunity soon Lou tell us about what was up with Waterseed uh, so we were it was weird uh, we were kind of in a transition kind of period so we were putting together our summer tours and everything like that, you know, confirming some dates. Um, but ironically, we 
just kind of finished, we wrapped up a run. So we were kind of resetting for the next run, had you know uh, quite a few shows already booked, uh, but not enough, but our tour wasn't filled. It was maybe like six or seven road shows and we were still filling stuff in. Um, so for us, it was a pause, um, but it caught us, I guess if it was gonna happen for us because of what we were going through, it happened at the perfect time. Um, but yeah, who knew it would be this long? So that was, that was you know, my experience with what happened. And Chris, I know, you know you've, you're always involved in some project, producing these young guys, working on some project. What were you up to? I know, you know you also have a lot of stuff that goes on during French Quarter Fest, Jazz Fest. That, tell us a little bit about how the great pivot started with you. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, I mean, the irony of it is that in some way, I feel like I've been trying to convince musicians to get into live streaming for a couple of years now, and everybody had their reservations like, I don't know how this works, or where does the money come from, or where, where does rights go, and stuff like that. And then when, when quarantine happened, my phone, you know, just blowing up. Hey, can you still help me get online, and how does that work? And so I kind of, you know, was prepared in the sense that, like, I knew what was going to happen or what needed to happen but I didn't have anybody to really guinea pig before it happened, and then I had plenty of guinea pigs, and it was just a matter of seeing the opportunity. It felt a little bit like after Katrina, where it's like, okay, I have two choices here. I can either lay on the sofa and hope that this blows over, which knowing myself, that would be a perfectly fine alternative, but, or I can buckle down and do something and maybe make a contribution and help out some of these people who are struggling, and there was one particular artist who kind of, you know, he, he posted, hey, does anybody know how to apply for for unemployment. I was like, not as long as I'm drawing a breath will you have to apply to unemployment if I can help it, you know? So taught him how to live stream and it was kind of off and running from there. Well, that's good to know. Um, Stuart, tell us a little bit about what you were doing at that time. Um, I was actually in the process of uh, confirming and advancing a lot of music festivals I was working. Um, I was getting some stage manager gigs. I was starting to get those in order and then uh, it, the news came right before we were supposed to uh, put on the Tibois Blues Festival, which, uh, for those of you not familiar, you know, it's an it's a outdoor festival on an alligator form out in the bayou. It's a really cool place, but all outdoors, uh, tons of land. So what they did is they capped it at like 100 people, um, and I think only about 75 showed up. Everyone had plenty of distance to camp out, um, plenty of areas on the spit, you know, to spread out, you know, in front of the stage. So we ended up having it. Um, you know, the promoter, they were on the phone with health and officials, and I believe they even talked to the governor at one point in time just to let them know. And, um, you know, we got, the, we got the green light, and we made it happen. And, you know, everyone did it safely. Everyone was sanitizing all day. Everyone spread it out. And, uh, but it had that kind of, we called it the last gig on earth. <laughs> you know, and we're pretty sure this had to have been the last live music that happened. We're pretty sure in the world because Alvin Young Bud Hart played till about 2.30 in the morning, three in the morning uh, the last night. And so we're pretty sure that that was the last live music that echoed into the, the universe before this, you know, the world shut down. And what an appropriate artist to take it out, right? Exactly, <laughs> it, was, it was beautiful. He used to live down the street from me. So I wanted to kind of, you know, keep it there for a second and just talk a little bit, and this may be more applicable to the artist. Um, like, what did you go through psychologically, mentally? Like, how long was it, did you sit there wondering what's going to happen before you actually thought of this online thing? Or had you already been doing any kind of long online performances prior to that? Anybody want to start? I'll start. I hadn't done any online performances. It was completely foreign to me. Um, even the thought of it. In fact, I used to frown upon it. I was like, why would I want to broadcast my gigs online? They need to come out and see me, right? I mean, I remember thinking that. And um, I just thought of it as a, I, I thought of it in a negative point of view because I figured that if you wanted to come to the show, it should be a live experience. Obviously, I feel like being there live, you can't really, you couldn't, sub, you can't substitute that. And I didn't want to give people an excuse not to come out to my shows because I feed off of a live audience. So I kind of had a negative idea about it um, uh, until there, were, there, there really was no other choice. And I really had to turn my, my concept of what it meant to be online and live streaming. And I had no idea what that meant, but I sure got used to it <laughs> because I realized that not only was it necessary 
for me to connect to my audience, but it was necessary for the people who had nowhere to go, the people who were used to going out and being entertained. You couldn't go anywhere. I mean, there was nowhere to, you, you, you had to find another way. And if this was the way, whether you liked it or not, it was what we had. How long did the time period before you actually I would decided say, to bite the uh, bullet and do it? What was it, the 14th of March when we were uh, shut down? I believe it was sort of like the 28th of March. So, I mean, pretty, pretty soon. Um, I was egged into it through a neighbor, uh, through my neighborhood association. Uh, initially, uh, a friend, her name is Bella, in the neighborhood, had seen this video of the Italians um, who had been quarantined for quite longer than we had, singing to each other on their balconies. That was except they video. sounded really, really good, okay? They, they must have been opera singers all in the same neighborhood. So we had this idea to do it in Algiers Point, and we did. And I did it sort of as an acapella thing where we invited the neighbors to sing along virtually. And then I was like, you know what? I should do this with my own show, and that's sort of how it began. Lou? Uh, for me, uh, you know, I'm a underneath all the music and stuff, I'm like a massive nerd. So we were always like into like, how can we do Oculus? How can we do this? So we were already playing around with like how to get involved and stuff. So uh, our previous tour, we would do this thing called City Pop, which when we're on tour, we would just set up an iPhone and like do an acoustic version of one of our songs, you know, in every in different cities. So, uh, and that was really successful. So just before COVID happened, we're like, we want you know, our fans to know a little bit more about us, so let's start a podcast. And we did. So literally two weeks before this happened, we were doing podcasts, like, you know, just a conversation, conversations that are usually what we have, like, in the van, just off the wall conversations. Um, so for us, the first thing we, when this was about to happen, the first thing that happened was we said, well, how can we do something to give back to artists. And we, uh, myself and two other uh, friends, we came up with the uh, Band Together Benefit concert. And we pushed that through through the city and put on, um, had certain artists, we found sponsors to support a number of artists. And we, um, basically the concept was, how do we get quote unquote New Orleans most famous artists in one setting to perform and then raise money and then give all the money to everybody that's in need. So uh, we did that. So for, for, for me, what's kept me like mentally like together is helping other people. So, and even if, you know, if I'm struggling financially or something like that, it still uh, helps me to say, okay, well, yeah, I have my issues, but the more, it seems the more and more I give, or the more and more we as a group or entity try to give, we get more opportunity. So that's what's kept me kind of grounded through all of this and actually positive to the things like, oh, well, this isn't happening. So this is an opportunity to try to do something for somebody else. And so that's what's helped me, you know, uh, as far as the band itself, because of all the things we've done, we've had opportunities to perform, you know, to perform a few times in live stream. Um, it's very different because there's no reciprocity in it. You you just send your sound into the void and it's like you're done with a song and it's like, oh, hey, next song, you know, but so it's weird, but it's, you have to adapt. And that's, that's what I always tell anybody, it's like adapt. You know, we don't know when we're gonna, this is gonna change, so yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. And before we go any further, if you do have questions, put them in the chat and someone from the foundation is reading the chat and they'll, send them to me, so um, I just wanted to let you know that. I don't know where the chat is. I don't see the chat in this room, but I know it's somewhere. Um, Don, I want to ask you, so what, how long, and then what was your first, if, if this is your first time doing it, what was that like? Like what, did you just set up a phone in front of you? Did you do it on, tell us a little bit about your first experience here with that. Um, it was about the March 21st or 22nd, and I guess I hadn't really thought about it uh, in depth, but I did realize that nobody's going to see me doing anything. So my initial thought was just to stay relevant. <laughs> so I... Um, I, I think, I'm not sure what happened first, but I actually, I do a thing in the mornings, every morning at 8 a.m. I'm a morning person. Yeah. I get up and um, 
I have coffee on the porch with Don Vappi. I just put the phone in front of me. It was leaning against the flower pot. And I just said, hey, everybody, I'm here on my porch having coffee. I figured I got to do it anyway. Might as well have it with you. So that's how it started. And as, as I've been told, as odd as it seems, it's really interesting. <laughs> and um, then at 3 p.m., I would go in and play, um, just play solo banjo or solo guitar. I haven't figured out a way to get my bass in the picture real good. Just whatever I want. And the thing is, I'm actually very vulnerable because I... I play things I don't know how to play. I'll just jump in and I'll make mistakes sometimes. I'm like, so what, you know? And I, I just do it. I'm just there. And um, I've done it now. F well, I took a break from the 3 o'clock thing last week, but I've been online now 246 days consecutively since March 14th. And I have listeners. Uh, this morning someone was in from uh, England on their boat. I uh, have a regular listener from New Zealand, have uh, people all over the U.S., you know, New York, Connecticut, St. Louis, Texas, around the corner from my house, Slidell, I mean, you know. So, I mean, there's people everywhere. Just the, the New Zealand one really got me, though, because they're like so far, the time zone is so way out. But it's more, it's more than just connecting and being relevant now I, i've i didn't realize i had so many fans because i'm not a promoting type person i'm it might seem i'm sometimes when i'm on stage i figure you're in my living room so i'll invite you in but i'm not one to go out and say oh look i'm really great and i can do this and that i just i just kind of do it and figure that's somebody else's job to judge what they think so i've made these I've got these new fans, which are kind of like, more than fans, they're like friends that we meet every morning. In addition, I met, I don't know if you know Josh Fox. He does uh, Staying Home with Josh Fox on, he's a uh, I'll check it out. activist. Uh, he was Bernie Sanders' campaign manager last go around, but he's a climate activist. He did the movie uh, about the fracking and the water burn. Well, he does a show on TYT every night now. He got it on TYT. So every Friday, I do the song of the week. So that's been a lot of fun because I write these political songs every week, just original stuff. And some of it's good. Some of it's like, ooh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> but I do it, you know. So I think it's cool. So. Well, you know, you hit on a very important point is that, you know, you're, you're – through your unique way of communicating with your fans, you know, you're doing something that these big major record companies have been trying to get artists to do forever, which is build that personal relationship with their fans. And, you know, you're doing it in a way that endears them to you because they get to see, like, like you said, you get to get up and have coffee with you in the morning. Yeah. I did it this morning just because I knew you were doing it and I wanted to be prepared for tonight. You know, and yeah. I love it. You just sit there, hey, Joe, hey, Susie, I see you. Oh, yeah, I see you in uh, England yeah, tuning I mean, in, you know. They're, they're and, here now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sharing this, so they're, they're so I love that. Y'all are great, you know. <laughs> Y'all are great, so that's awesome. So I want to kind of turn a little bit towards since we are talking about best practices. I kind of want to talk a little bit about you know being geeky and techy and nerdy. Something about you know even gear. Like you started off with a, just a cell phone being propped up. I'd love to hear from each of you on the concept of, you know, what I started with and where my experiences has led me to be able to, like, improve or what I invested in to make the next thing better. So um, why don't we start with maybe the tech guy? Uh, you know, maybe start with Chris, because I know Chris. Chris I know too, stuff way I know too much. I don't know. And I, mean, I know he knows so much. That's a pretty pretty dark hole to dove, dive down into when you talk about gear with um, but the, the bottom line is it's available to anyone anytime. Like every phone on this stage right now can go live like that. And so the, the first thing that I have this discussion with uh, folks is there's really no barrier to entry. And from there, it's just degrees of quality. And it's a very subtle thing. Sometimes you can spend this much more effort to get this much better. 
but you're that much better than everybody else who's just on a phone or whatever. And, you know, so I, I kind of think of it in tiers. There's like the just get on with the phone by any means necessary, then maybe you can raise the level of the phone by getting a clip-on microphone or something that plugs into the phone for a microphone. Then maybe the next level would be like those clip-on lenses. That company Moment makes some amazing lenses. For a hundred bucks, you've got something that looks like a, an SLR or a DSLR camera now. Um, and then, you know, Wirecast or OBS. OBS is free, literally free. You can, it's insanely powerful, that, that software. And I mean, I, I, I use a, a program called Wirecast because I kind of coming at it from a, a corporate standpoint is like how you pay the bills so that you can do the fun stuff. And you, there's some things that Wirecast does that you just need to be able to rely on. After that, unless you're doing those things, you don't need, it's like, it's the argument of Pro Tools and Logic over again. It, it doesn't matter, just create. But since you touched on that, and since I'm not sure all of our listeners, and maybe even everybody on the stage even understands OBS and Wirecast, can you give us just a little basics like on what does that mean? What does it entail? What does it do in this process of going from your phone to get some, something out to the world? Yeah, so basically, every, you know, your phone has a camera built into it that you can, through various protocols, send your stream instantly from your phone. To do that on a computer, you need some software that's going to encode the video signal from whatever source. It can be a webcam right there in the top of your camera. It can be your phone plugged into your computer. It can be a really nice camera. It can be a full TV truck. It, you know, the, 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 the quality of what you put into it is almost limitless. Uh, but so in some way, you have to bundle it together. You have to encode it and package it in such a way that the, the, the receiving part of the internet can take it. You have to have some controls over it. Um, if you want to adjust the color or if you want to superimpose titles or graphics on top of that, there's one software that will pull all that together. And OBS is kind of the de facto get started with this software, you know. It, it does all of those things if you're willing to learn how to use it. I know I'm going to butcher your name again. Ani, Anais, right? Anais. Perfect. Tell us a little bit about your, I want to hear about your Okay, setup, so I, I rode, luckily my, I, had a, I have an upright piano in my living room that I rode out to my porch, and my friend Harry Marone takes the ferry from the French Quarter, and Shows up at my house, we do a one-hour rehearsal, and then we go live. I use my Mac computer and my sound, my PA system, and then I plug in a ball mic computer. And we started in the spring, and we, had, we did an, every show every Saturday at 4 o'clock, so the lighting was perfect. We're noticing it a little bit different now. But um, from what we found, that was all we needed. The only uh, caveat was the Internet. Bum, bum, bum. And if you're having any Internet issue that would totally mess up your show. I have 12-year-old girls at my house. I have a daughter and her friends who are always on the computer, so I would have to kick them off the computer and hope that the internet was doing well. Honestly, this, is, this week will be my 32nd port show. I'm doing them every Saturday, and I've only had maybe about three Saturdays where I had major internet issues. Um, weather, um, if it's raining, I would do it inside, but other than that, the Mac, the ball mic, the sound system, and I was able to get a really good, presentable show. That's cool. Lou, what about you? I'm coming back to you, Stuart. Uh, so, wow, just a huge variety of options. Uh, so we started the podcast initially with my phone, my iPhone 8, you know, uh, just recorded it all, then brought it to my Mac and loaded it up and went. Then when everything really shut down, we did like Zoom. And we just recorded that. So it's just everybody, some people from their phone, some people, you know, from their Macs recorded that. For live streams, um, we've been fortunate in most of the venues that we've live streamed from have had, like, systems there. So, um, you know, House of Blues has a 4K camera. But, you know, the thing that they do twice or three times a week, if you're there, it's one 4K camera iPhone, iPad, iPhone going into OBS, and it's not like something that you don't have, you know, you can't do yourselves. Uh, our podcast now, we're kind of in the same room, kind of distant, wherever, but it's that's simple again. It's just two iPads going into OBS. That's it. Uh, any live streams we do is always important since we're a band to have a good sound, good sound, and have it kind of mixed and doing the right thing. So we've just, you know, found a variety of ways to do it. So um, we, we did something for Commander's Palace that 
had the OBS set up and everything, had it running through a system, sending it to them. And it was like, hey, it sounds weird. We just literally unplugged everything and it literally went in. It was a better sound going straight from my iPhone. So it's just, it just depends. You know, you can do this. Yeah, you can do this, um, you know, any way you can. And I think what Don said is most important as musicians, maybe they're realizing now is those gigs, you think you're just doing them to make money. But with, music, with the music industry moving so quickly all the time, artists, it's, it's not like how it used to be where if you were away, that was a good thing. Then you came back and people love you. Now it's like if you're away, you're not relevant anymore. And so you have to do as much, and, and this especially to the local musicians that I know, it's like I haven't heard from a lot of them and I get it. It could be an emotional thing. It could be all of these things, but you have to stay relevant. Do something to stay relevant for your fans because they need you, your entertainer, to maybe make them feel better, you know? So do that, be that person by any means necessary, so. Thank you. Stuart, um, Friday nights at the Funky Uncle. Yeah, tell us about that. I mean, that sounds like a really cool program. I'd love to, because I, I went to your website, it looks like you've assembled a whole crew that you're working out of a money. Yeah, tell us a little bit about how that got started and where it's, where it's going and where, you know. Totally. Um, so it was an idea that came up between um, Christian Duque as well as uh, Chris Berry from uh, the crew of Tux. And then uh, Chris Duque leads uh, the Soul Project, great band uh, locally. And, um, you know, the crew of Tux has this uh, social aid and pleasure club within it called the uh, Crew of Fat Bankers, which has a Mardi Gras loop called the Funky Uncle Lounge, which they always have a band play. Um, they've got a full PA system on stage and the bands play on the float as they go down the parade route. It was really cool, and the floats got pictures of James Booker and Professor Longhair and all of our, you know, New Orleans greats around the side. So there were a bunch of music lovers, and when this all happened, they wanted a, a way that they could give back to help our local music uh, community. And you know, with all the um, with all the the streams happening, they wanted to make something. We wanted something that would that would stand out. So we have we actually have a full audio visual crew. Um, these guys have worked on major music videos with Paul McCartney and Guns N' Roses, and I mean they've done it all. Uh, major motion pictures. So basically, these guys are, are super sharp, and they set up a whole audio visual sound stage in front of the Mardi Gras float. So it looks amazing because you have all these cool float art, and the band plays in front of it. I stand up on top of the float, the host. But we've got you know full audio console right there everything's mic'd up um, we've got something like I think six cameras high def digital cameras and then we've got people manning the boards giving you different angles and all that so um our whole thing was making it like a very you know just full-on pro shot because because we had the space to do it safely the only reason you know because we it's a massive warehouse you know with Mardi Gras floats so we could put the band six feet apart and our crews you know very diligent at wiping everything down sterilizing it everyone wears masks in there and uh, it looks you know looks great and sounds great and how long have y'all been doing that we've been doing it ever since um, I think we are uh, we're coming up on our 35th week Wow yeah so basically Amazing. it was uh, two weeks after COVID we got this whole thing up and running and uh, haven't missed a week since it, it I mean I know it's not the same for everybody out there but I mean I'm just impressed with all y'all that you weren't wasting any time you all got right into it and uh, and I've heard from a lot of people who have those reservations about doing it I know personally I've done like four live streams and I, I it's a weird deal for being on stage and play into an empty room and I know it's uh, part of it is like how do you get you don't get that feedback like you were saying from your audience and stuff so it, it is kind of weird um, I want to turn the attention a little bit to the financial aspects of things, you know, because is there any money in it? Have you been able to make any kind of income from it? I'm not talking about you, Finney, because I know you, you figured that part out. But from the artist standpoint, um, have you monetized it at all? What ways have you done it? Has there been a format that's worked? Maybe even talk about... Um, what formats do you go through? Is it Facebook Live? Is it YouTube? Is it something else? Um, and has any one of those been more successful or not or the other with regard to getting people to shell out a few dollars to support your efforts? Don, you got an idea? Want to share anything? Well, I, I, did, uh, I do Facebook Live and I have uh, opportunity for people to tip me. Uh, Venmo, PayPal, and and actually, I, that's that's the hardest thing for me, man. After Katrina, the very hardest thing for me to do 
was to go to the Red Cross in Ohio and tell them that I need some money. My mother was there. My wife was there. I've never had to really say that. that that's hard. <laughs> so, but, you know, that's what I, I'm a musician. I, people tip me when I play sometimes, you know. So well, I'm not getting paid to play, but then I just thought, you know, they must, if you feel it. And I don't, and look, there's a lot of people out of work, so I don't push it. Because a lot of people, what I'm doing for them mentally, you know, is a, a big reward as well. So if you can afford five bucks, if I got some people that chip in. It's almost like they're um, uh, renewing a subscription for me, but I, I don't force it. I do have plans to start this other service with uh, some lessons where it's subscription-based on different levels. But um, yeah, Facebook Live, and then, you know, I've got I've gotten some teaching gigs from that. Uh, one person, in lieu of a tip, redesigned my website. Gotta love that. So I that's mean, valuable for me. That's very valuable, and it's a donvappy.com, by the way. <laughs> you can check it out. It's still got some things to to work on, but I, I also uh, started up my record label again. So I'm gonna start doing things at home. And people mostly know me as a banjo player. But you know, I, I posted a picture one day of me 40 years ago, my fro, you know, and I was like, this guy plus 40 years equals this guy. <laughs> but you know, I'm still into all of that. I still got my rack, man. I still got all my effects. I still got my telly, my 335. I still play oh, funk. I've seen you play the big jazz box before. I love it. I got the big one, too. You got the arch top, seven string. My first love is bass. I think it will always will be bass. I just feel it. Yeah. But, you know, like right now I'm working on a, some music I never got to learn from a John McLaughlin album from 1979 called Electric Dreams. So I'm, I'm starting to just transcribe the whole record, man. Oh, you're a man after my heart. I, I love that stuff, man. Yeah. Guardian Ana, Angels. Yeah. Anais, have <laughs> you been able to, like, because, like, I've watched your video and you got the whole neighborhood dancing. Uh, yeah. I'm, first of all, I just want to say that I'm grateful that I am able to do this. Uh, I am able to roll my piano out to my porch and I am able to have my, my pianist, Harry Marone, come to my house every Saturday and to be able to p perform my art. I'm grateful that I have the fans who tune in every week. I'm grateful that my neighbors can come and sit in front of my house, socially distanced. And they are faithful and they are wonderful. And I always say donations are appreciated if you are able. But I have been blessed that um, the people who do turn in, tune in have been generous and are, 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 are able to, to, to show their appreciation for um, having a little bit of, of joy every Saturday. Um, and, and I just make it a point of, of letting them know that I appreciate them, whether they are able to donate or not. But it has been something that I look forward to as far as my own fulfillment, fulfillment of being able to do my art, but also having that little bit extra of what I would make on, I do a one hour show, uh, I think I probably make about the same amount driving to the French Quarter and doing a gig at, in the French Quarter. Um, but ultimately it's about appreciation for my fans and appreciation for doing a, giving a service to my neighborhood and to people who are unable to go out, pretty much everyone, and who can tune in and um, enjoy a little joy on a Saturday. No, that's awesome. And, you know, I've heard, I'm on these calls every day <laughs> with people all over the country, and I've heard from a lot of folks who are artists or managers of artists who they found their niche in whatever it is. And in some cases, they're like, you know, why would I ever leave my house again? I make just as much money sitting here because I figured it out. And I've, I've found in the big picture, it's usually the people who have spent the time over the last 10 years, 15 years, really building an online audience and building that following and paying attention to their social media and that, that they're able to leverage that now in this COVID time. And it's the folks who never really gave a darn about social media that now are trying to figure out how do I get people to pay attention to me when so many other things are going on, you know? So I think that, you know, that's a byproduct 
or, a, or an eye opener for a lot of people is that like, you know, this is important and it should have been. And like, I was just talking to a, a, an artist manager from down the bayou and uh, he was telling me about this young artist he just started managing out of New Iberia that's become one of the biggest guys on TikTok. And he had a big TikTok hit. And when I'm telling you, it's a big six figures that this kid is raking in from us. He's played three live shows in his life. He's like 20 years old. And he's making bank because he's totally focused on social media and performing online and use, utilizing the new technology that's out there. Um, we have a couple of questions from the online audience. And I'm going to send the first one to Finney. And it's asking, uh, what do you recommend as the best streaming platforms? What's the most stable and stuff that you've seen since you are kind of been my go-to guru guy? Yeah, there's a, that's, there's a lot of different choices and we kind of have an embarrassment of riches on some level with what's available, but it depends on what your goal is. If you're trying to reach people, the audiences are on Facebook. There's limitations to the technical quality and then you're always up against the almighty Facebook algorithm, which is its own nightmare. And in the same vein, uh, YouTube and its algorithm have their own eccentricities. Uh, but the difference becomes that YouTube, being owned by Google, the infrastructure of that content distribution network is insane. It's so robust. You can stream live in 4K. You can stream live in 360. Things that 99% of the consumers aren't even ready to observe correctly. YouTube has already built out the infrastructure to be able to do that. So it's that's kind of the two extremes, you know. Um, Instagram, there's the easiest way to get live on Instagram is with your phone. I can help you get live on Instagram using a computer, but let's just say it may or may not involve a Russian hacker and some backdoor situation, but it can be done. It's just a royal pain in the butt. So it's kind of like they're forcing you to go live on your phone. And so I try to advise folks to think about where their audience is, think about the quality of production that they're gonna go into. I have clients who spend tens of thousands of dollars on the video production. They're not just gonna send that out to whatever Joe's online service. You know, we kind of have to think a little more robust. And like you were saying, the, the internet quality becomes a factor. You know, there's a lot of choices around town, but in the end, you still have to, you, you, you could be in a situation where you have to pull out a hotspot to make sure that show goes off. So there's so many links in the chain. Your best bet is to try to reduce those variables as much as possible. And, you know, Twitch is a fantastic platform. It's basically the Wild West for musicians right now, uh, especially if you're playing pre-recorded music like a DJ. Their bots that sense uh, copyrighted music are not as aggressive as YouTube's. YouTube won't let you get away with it live. Facebook usually won't let you get away with it live. So you haven't had to, haven't had to. I'm I'm about to say, man, I'm I'm nothing against DJs, but you know how much it costs to make a record. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> and they get to use that recorded stuff and I charge know. more for a gig than you can bring a live band in to do the gig. It's true. And it's so not a New Orleans tradition. Mm -hmm. It's always been a tradition here that our music has a social function in our society. It has a purpose, and it really doesn't matter what kind of style you play because. Whatever we did, you have to know at least a couple of New Orleans songs That's right. because there's a function for what we do. I don't see that so much anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> well, you know, Don, one of the things that I think about when I think about you is how authentic you are as a New Orleanian and as a New Orleans musician. And so, you know, when I think about a group or an artist like you, I mean, because our group, try, my band tries to be a New Orleans band too. We try to do exactly what you said. Make sure we play some New Orleans in everything we do. But how do you translate that social function aspect online? You know, whether it's lead a second line through the crowd or whatever those things may be, a sing along, a, a call and response. You know, it, it's a different story. So I can imagine that it's harder to really translate that authenticity. Well, what do you, you know? We're, the reality is we're becoming a global community. Without a doubt. There's a lot of people here that are not from here. I'm cool with that. But, and there's a lot of people that take advantage of something that just happens and say, oh, we're gonna do this. Like, 
I don't know how many second lines I see for weddings and parades and things, and that's fine. I just think that as a community, we haven't done a really good job of defining who we are and showing how the history of the music that started at the turn of the 1900s, 1900 is the basis for everything we hear now. That music, without the internet, made it around the world and it's still played in places you would never believe, man. You go somewhere out in the middle of nowhere with people riding yaks and stuff and they're gonna pull out a banjo or a clarinet and start playing some New Orleans jazz. I mean, that's just, I'm not saying it should be all because I grew up with funk and I love it. I love funk, but funk is all up in New Orleans jazz. You see what I mean? Yeah. So I'm just saying that as a, as a city, I mean, after Katrina, you know, everybody's worried about opening up at the nighttime. You know, we got a curfew. Well, hell, have the gigs in the afternoon. Invite your families to come and check it out. But no, I mean, but you know, at some point in your life, in my life, at some point in my life, I got tired of arguing about it, and I'm not the kind of person that's gonna do that. Because everything seems to be about money. And my thing has never been about money. That's why I'm okay. <laughs> That's good to know. Well, you know, and it's a little bit off of our topic, but I think it's important to discuss as New Orleanians. One of the, and you mentioned it earlier, Don, about, you know, taking this platform and actually offering lessons and finding ways. And, you know, so what I've enjoyed with some of the things I've watched online, you know, and I'll take John Cleary, for instance, you know, like one of his regular shows is him doing something like just playing piano or saying, okay, this is how Toots Washington would have played this song and this is how Dr. John would have approached it. And he's giving you a history lesson at the same time. You know, but he's also doing the one finger piano lessons. You know? So for me, it's like how do you cut through the clutter and educate people at the same time and keep your traditions alive and let people know that what we have is really special and you know, needs to be celebrated and supported and everything else. So, I mean, maybe I'm just... No, it's, it's one word. You do just like the old musicians I worked with did. You be gracious about it. That's all. Just be gracious about it. Share what you have. And, you know, just share it. Be free with it. Everybody going to get paid. <laughs> yeah. One thing I like to say, uh, definitely along the lines of what Don's saying and what you're saying, uh, like the Cleary stream, one of my favorite things is he sat down there with Walter Wolfman in Washington and they just told stories for, I mean, a while, and I mean, deep stories. And I mean, and, and John was talking about when he first moved to New Orleans in the 80s and played with Walter and then story he'd heard about Walter from the 70s. I mean, and it was just amazing. And, you know, Walter is one of the greatest interviews, if you've ever done I mean, he's got stories for days. So one of the things that we did at the Funky Uncle to kind of, you know, bring that in is we started doing an interview section of the, of the segment, you know, where after the bands play live, they sit down with me, we call it sitting in with Soul Stew, and we, you know, I interview them, they tell stories and kind of give their histories, and, our, you know, it's been something that our watchers really seem to enjoy, especially, you know, with someone like Walter or Don or any of these guys who have just this wonderful knowledge of the music, but also the, they've lived it for so long, and I mean, they're a part of the living part of this history. We've got so many great stories that, uh, that are just so wonderful to hear, and they're the only ones who, who have them at this point, you know, and the, the further we get down, that if more of those stories disappear, so to keep those alive is something that we've uh, really enjoyed doing. It's something that's very special to us at the Funky Uncle. No, I appreciate that you're doing it because to me that's really special. And uh, to be able to continue those traditions of passing down, I mean, because you know, you think about New Orleans in general, especially pre Katrina, it was always passed down the cultural communication from generation across the porches, across the street, from the church to the club to the front porch, you know, so um, it's glad to hear that. And just Look, to piggyback on that, the whole concept of a virtual gig, the, the concept of you being your own boss, of doing your own thing, this is a freedom that many of us haven't had because when we're hired by the hotels, when we're hired by the restaurants, we know, you know, there's a specific um, guideline to which we have to do, of what we have to do. This kind of opens up a whole new world of what are you going to offer to your fans, to your audience, to the people who are there in person, or just to the people who are watching on these various sites? What are you going to offer that you couldn't offer at these corporate gigs? What can you give? And that's what's really going to pull those fans in, and that's what's going to keep them coming back. Personalize For me, it. I was able to, hey, I'm going to do a different theme every week. 
I couldn't do that where I was working. You know, I, I couldn't, and I didn't even think about it, to be honest with you. But what you're talking about, telling the stories, connecting through, through interviews, giving a little bit of that personal touch that normally your fans wouldn't be able to see at, a, at, at your regular gigs. It's something special. Well, I would, I would, I'm sitting here listening to everybody, and I'm thinking about, um, you know, all the stuff I read on social media. And I've, I've been conflicted. I'm like, okay, do I really want to get in this conversation at this moment? But this is what I'm going to say. Um, born and raised here in New Orleans, so for those people who are like, well, you know, transplant, all the rest of that foolishness. Whatever. Born and raised here, right here in New Orleans. Um, learned music right here in New Orleans. Had great mentors. Um, at the same time, I've lived in other cities and played music, and I've had to start from that nobody to, oh, he's somebody in, in multiple cities. Um, and I look, I get the COVID thing, but this is what's not going to help the community in gigging. And I hope that this is an eye opener for local musicians here in that uh, kind of what Don said, it is your responsibility to figure out how to continue your craft or go do something else. And I'm not saying that it's not hard for everybody. It is. It's hard for me. It's hard for everybody to adapt. But complaining about it doesn't solve anything. Other cities, other entities, they're struggling too. But the one thing that they, when, when I've lived in other cities, they've always sought out the cutting edge technology. They've always sought out, how do I get ahead? What's the new thing? What's gonna give me an edge? In New Orleans, rightfully so, is our identity. We're huge stage performance people. We're all about being amazing musicians. That's what we do. You know, that's how, that's the, that's the, that's the rites of passage that we, we go through. And I get it, and it makes, it makes our mentality one way. But I think, I've, I personally, and I'll take full ownership for this, I think we've been one-sided about it. And I think we have to look at the full in industry and say, okay, I've made great music. What's the vehicle to get that to everybody? What is the trend to get it to everybody? How do I, and you know, Reed, you and I have had this conversation a, lot, a long time, and I was uh, a professor of mine told me about mailbox money. What's that? And then I started, you know, I was a very young guy, and but everybody else, when I moved to other cities, they're not making most of their living from performing. They're making a decent amount also from their intellectual property and their songs. Here in New Orleans, we can make a great living and record our album in two days and kind of sell it, but not really promote it when we're on stage. And we hope it does stuff and whatever. And it's like, okay, cool. And But we're making so much money from performing. Now that that's gone, I hope that this whole situation, um, I'm, I'm kind of like, Put up a shut up. I'm kind of like, and I always quote this song by this artist, I won't name him, but it goes, when my back is so far back, it's on the other side of the wall, when half the chance is all I get, if I get a chance at all. When the toughest gets tougher than the tough can go, I grind the ax, and that's when I go to the max. So the thing, as Prince, I'll say who it was. But the idea, but the idea is like, even for that guy that was so advanced, he was still hit every time, but he never laid down. He said, I am going to do this and I'm gonna push it with all of my energy. So this is that situation, this is how I internalize it. I hope other musicians are too. I think we have to stop um, blaming other people for this. Look, I, I have a person that I blame for this all the time and you know, they're out of reach and it is what it is and we're gonna be here a little longer because of this person but the idea is that in the meantime, what are you doing to support your family? When things go back to normal, are you the guy that stayed still? Or were you doing things to advance so that you can hit the ground running? That is your responsibility, nobody else's. So I hope that musicians in general, or I get it, if you're depressed, if you went through it and everything, I get it, but start doing something. And I think you have to do what Don is saying too, do it, everybody's broke. You know, that's why I didn't get into the conversation about how much are you making now? Because I know I was, oh, that's nice tips. But then it's everybody got broker and broker. Oh, how long are we going to stay here? Oh, oh, the money is sunk. And it's like, do you stop playing music? Then maybe you shouldn't have been a musician, you know, kind of deal. So uh, that's all for whatever that's well, worth. To that point, that's I think that's the number one reason to even put money on your radar as an artist is sustainability. I, I heard Quint Davis say this one time about Jazz Fest. He said the genius of Jazz Fest was not thinking it up. It was doing it again next year and then the next year and the next year and the next year so that 50 years of Jazz Fest have popped up. 
And I think that's, that's sage advice when it comes to money and being able to sustain. Because like, okay, so the money fairy comes down and blesses you with insane wealth that you can now retire. What are you going to do? I want to just sit at home and play music. Okay, you have that opportunity right now without the money fairy. You can sit home and play music and your audience, you, you don't have to go on tour. You can create your thing and whatever your thing is, people will tune in. You find ways to re-engage with the audience and that, that loop happens again. It's different, but it's, it's not implausible at all. Well, you know, it kind of is a great segue into one of the questions that came in. And I'll say that my very first live stream gig, we did it as a fundraiser for Jazz and Heritage Foundation's um, Musicians Fund. And we raised a few thousand bucks, which I was happy to make sure, you know, help other musicians by doing, you know, the, what was your name of your thing? The uh, band Together Benefit. Band Together. So the same the con concept, you know, play some music to raise some money for other musicians. But the thing that we learned was that we had people tuning in from every state in the union. We had people tuning in from Europe. We had 20,000 views at the end of the week. I don't remember how many we had that night, but because it played all week long. And it's like, no matter how many gigs we play locally, we're never going to get 20,000 people looking in. So the question then becomes, and this is the question that came in, and it was actually one of the questions I had pre-written. So say we get back to um, normal life, if there is such a thing, if and when and we go back to normal gigging. So have you learned your lesson? Are you gonna to continue to do some online stuff? Have you made enough online impressions that it's still worth doing it in some regular fashion? And I'd love to get each of your thoughts on that. Don, you wanna start? Sure. Uh, yes. I mean, things are starting to happen a little bit for me right now that I can't do my everyday three o'clock, but I'm gonna continue to keep in touch with all these fans and friends I've made around the world. And my hope is that when things get back to normal, I can tour and see them and play for them in person. Because that's part of what I want to keep going is, I mean, uh, I think Anais mentioned it, it's different when you play for an audience or some dancers than if you play online for a show. It's just different. And uh, especially would you, playing, I mean, whatever I've played in my life, there's a, what do you call it, symbiotic relationship where we feed off the dancers, the dancers feed off us, and it's going back and forth. It's always been that way. So that, I can't wait for that to happen again. But I will continue to stay online some kind of way because I realized that too. That's why I started my label back when, because I could make a record and sell it myself. Now, this whole streaming thing messed that up, you know, 0.3 cents. That's point a topic for another oh, yeah, sync up okay. discussion. I'll leave that alone. <laughs> I can't wait to get back to gigging, to get back to being on the stage with a live audience. But I tell you what, I am, I feel like I'm a little bit smarter where I'm going to be, I always have been particular about what, which gigs I would take, but even more so now because I have had this experience, hey, I don't have to leave my house and I can have the satisfaction and still do pretty well. That being said, I'm gonna do the live gig, but I'm also gonna set up a camera and, and live stream from the gig. Why not? Uh, I, my attitude has completely changed, um, and not just to make more money, but also to continue because I've had these fans tuning in, and, and there are people who cannot, no matter when we open, go to those clubs, and, and shouldn't. So it's, it's important to make sure that we still are being fair to them and giving them the opportunity to still be a part of our creativeness by, letting, by live streaming our, our actual shows. No, I think that's a great idea. Anybody else want to chime in on that? Yeah, I don't think it's ever going back to normal. I think we go back to the stage, but I think the whole world has learned that, no, there's something here. People are going to figure out how to monetize it, and there'll be an audience for it. But I think that uh, one thing this whole experience has done with COVID is opened up, oh, there are other possibilities. So I think we're going to see lots of new technology and new ways to use this. So no, I think as, a, as an artist, as for what we're doing, it's like, no, we're going to always figure out how to be present in the space because 
again, the last few artists who have been discovered have been discovered TikTok, Instagram. It's not, you know, at a show. It's, other, it's these social media outlets that are doing it. So as an artist, you, it would be very naive to think that you're going to get a quote unquote big break like this guy sees you in the back of the room and loves you. He may, but he's going to go then to your socials and be like, what are you doing there? So it, I think I, I'm never going back to if I was ever there. But no, it's, you know, it's I'm happy that if, if nothing else, the world has opened up a little more. And it's actually given the musicians who are interested the power to reach that person in Germany, that person in Japan. And it's normalizing it so that people are looking for these experiences. Cool. Stuart, I'm wondering, I mean, in the future, is the Funky Uncle Friday Night thing going to continue on? Yeah, you know, that's something we've kind of all been talking about once, uh, yeah, since this has all come down. You know, when we started it, we only thought we'd be doing it for a few months and then, you know, all these great players would be back on stage where they belong, you know. Um, and, of course, we've had to adapt uh, since then. But, you know, I think it's something that we, we would continue to do, but maybe in a different capacity. Because, once again, we do it on Friday nights. That's when these musicians are all out gigging. And uh, we definitely don't want to take, especially when things open back up, we don't want to take patrons away from, you know, the clubs or anything. But we've also talked about maybe doing stuff where we have, like, a live audience in the Funky Uncle Lounge and they, you know, pay a ticket price. Because we've got a great space there. There's a bar in there, and there's places for them to hang out. Um, and then the band could, you know, do their own performance, bring in their fans, and then also stream that out to the world for anyone who can't be there. So I think something like that, we would uh, definitely like to have the option to offer that to, to artists down the road, for sure. Uh, Finney, I know that, uh, didn't you work with the tips thing that just went on last Friday night? Uh, in a consulting capacity, not very So I guess... Now. My question to you is, do you think that the clubs will see this as an opportunity to like invest in it a little bit and actually add that to the mix of what they offer? They better. The, 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 the irony is, going back 15 years, before Katrina even, almost 20 years... Tips I tried had, to do that, right? I had a conversation yeah. with a particular club owner, rest in peace, and the, the, the argument against was... Well, if we show all the shows online, who's going to come in and buy the beer? And unfortunately, it took me years to realize my response. I didn't have it in the moment. But the response is, you're penetrating all these different markets where you wouldn't have connected otherwise. Your brand is now in Italy. Your brand is now in Africa. Your brand is now in you know, India. Your brand is everywhere in the world. And that first dead Friday in summer when you're not selling a single beer because it's summer in New Orleans and you know a, a, a tourist comes from Italy, the first place he wants to go is your club. And you just sold a beer on a Friday night that you never would have sold a beer before. So in essence, yes, it will get people to buy beer in a weird roundabout way, <laughs> you know. But the, I, I think no question, you know, even I look at my corporate jobs, all my events that were, you know, I was hired to help turn an, a, a real life event into an online event, just about all of them have said, no matter what, we want to do this again next year, and we want to have this online component. So I think it's not going away, and I think club owners, I've worked with a couple of club owners in town already who are building out the infrastructure so that at the very least they can put one camera on and go live, and just like you were saying about House of Blues, it's like you got that one good 4K camera, go live with it. I think back in the day, Tipitinas would do that before the storm. They had a little camera up there. Absolutely. Like, Fly would do lights yeah, and Fly mix the video. Exactly. The Rest yeah. Fly. And I'd Goody. be like, sometimes, oh, wait, oh, the band's on stage. We need to get over there. Right. Chris <laughs> Good. Yeah, well, that's the other thing is that in the future, you know, think about bar hopping when you've got four bands that you want to see at different clubs. Now you just click and you don't have to drink and drive. <laughs> you, don't have to, you know, and, and you can still take in as a consumer if it's that one weird night that you don't want to go out, but all the bands you want to see are playing, you don't get you don't have to miss out on it anymore. So I think it's never going away. You know, that's interesting. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about it myself. You know, because um, it's not only like you said with your corporate clients. You know, we're dealing with the same kind of issues with the Recording Academy and how we communicate with our members. And you know, you, there's never a place in that face to face, and we can't do it right now. But I think people have gotten more used to and comfortable with the online experience. And, um, you know, it still serves a purpose with connecting people from across big distances. And, and you know, you've been on my board, Chris. 
we cover five states, and there's just no way you're going to get people from St. Louis and Memphis and Lafayette and in the same room. Not but you in real can do time, that least, online, yeah. and we've seen some successful things, which you've streamed for me. Thank you. Go ahead, Don. One thing. I think more than anything, this pandemic, this time has given us all more power over what we do. And not to put it in another way, but we can weed out some of those people who used to sell us for a whole lot of money and give us a few pennies on the dollar. We can get our own agents to work for us as opposed to, you know. I just think it's a very empowering moment. Just like when I got my first Atari computer with MIDI. Yeah. You're dating yourself, Don. Hey, man. It had Atari one megabyte was the big one. Oh, I know. <laughs> 1040. 1040 ST. That's right. Ran on a floppy disk. Oh, yeah. I had them run on cassette. So we have a question that came in, and this might be geared towards the more techie folks on the panel. And it says, have you had an experience with a streaming aggregator? Wait. Stream, experience stream aggregator sites? that let you stream to multiple platforms? Yes. There's third-party aftermarket ones. There's ones that charge a fee. Um, there's some like uh, Vimeo, which is an insanely powerful content distribution network. If you pay a fee for them, you can stream to multiple sites from that one website. So it's a one-stop shop. It's kind of made moot if you have professional-level software because you can stream to multiple sites from that software and you don't have to pay anybody for that privilege. But there's a lot of good answers out there and the beautiful thing is that now there's a YouTube, there's an insane library of how to, you know, and, and that's, that would be my advice for somebody who's looking to integrate those things. Just invest an hour in YouTube videos and see who's having success and who isn't and that'll, it'll, it'll help you weed out a lot of the static quickly. Cool. Lou, I wanted to... Um touch with uh, talk with you a little bit I know you've kind of found your way into being sort of a go-to connector person with various things like the cities embrace the culture can you give us a little sense of what that what that vibe is like like how's that going how's that received by the artists from fans from the mayor's office things like that yeah so um, and I'm not look I'm not the only artist that um, works with the Embrace the Culture movement from the uh, Cultural Economy Department of New Orleans. Um, and we were fortunate when we did band together, we had to go through a whole lot of red tape because we literally had to get musicians in a studio when it was like nobody was allowed outside. So <clears throat> we had to do all type of legalities, everything just to make that happen. Um, and so that kind of started a relationship with the city. Um, so the city, and, and I'm, I'm assuming, I'm not going to say this, is what they're doing, what they were doing, but they had a, I uh, believe a concept, how do we let people know that New Orleans culture is still alive, as well as how do we give New Orleanians some way to exhale, something to see, to feel connected to the city. So Embrace the Culture is a event or a number of events that highlight different aspects of New Orleans culture. So there's yoga, there's the gospel, there's book readings, there's plays, there's everything. Uh, I was approached to do live music. So for uh, my little portion of that is I have two events. I have one called Go Live NOLA, which is from the House of Blues. Uh, and we basically have bands uh, that we have come on once a week and perform for about 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, and then we have another one called Hispanola uh, Live, which is basically all of the people from bands from the Hispanic community to get an outlet as well. We do that from the Jazz Museum. Uh, but the city gives us a very nice, but you know, it's a stipend. It's a stipend. It's not what the musicians are worth per musician, but it's not, the musicians do not have to rely upon the tips, even though we list that. It is like, hey, this is how much I have. Can you do it? And they can, from that point, say I can budget and do whatever. So, uh, and I don't know what other events look like, but ours is different in that we have a, a budget to work from when we hire musicians. So we've been able to 
uh, we've, we're in, we just finished season two last Wednesday, and we'll go into season three either in December or early January and just keep it going and try to give musicians the outlet. And the response from musicians have been, um, a lot of musicians have been, I'm just happy to be on stage. You know, it's like I have not played literally in six months. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for giving something so I can pay my guys. You know, so it's been, uh, we've received nothing but love and appreciation uh, from the people who have performed. And for me, what it does for me in, in, the, in Water Seed and the people I work with is it helps us. We've only done it once and all the rest of the time it's other musicians and it helps us feel like we're adding, uh, not, again, not complaining, but trying to add to like how do we like be a solution to what's happening? How do we do that? So I appreciate the uh, Embrace the Culture team uh, in the New Orleans cultural economy um, to, for, you know, hiring us, uh, and I use that loosely, asking us to produce these shows for them. So it's been a, a beautiful experience. Cool. Um, along those, I mean, we've heard about the Friday night at Funky Uncles. We've heard about Embrace the Culture. Um, Anais or Don, have y'all participated in any of these kind of other, are there other examples of these kind of concert series things that y'all maybe have participated in or has it strictly been your own I shows? am very excited to be appearing at the Jazz Museum series that they've been doing um, on Tuesdays uh, from their balcony. So um, I'm go actually going to be playing with my uh, jazz trio, Mike Esnault, Mark Brooks, and Doug Belote on Tuesday at 5 o'clock. Um, and that's going to be the first gig I've done outside of my porch. Um, so I'm super excited, and I know that they have given many, many bands that opportunity. I've, I've done, um, as Chris was saying about OBS, I use OBS. Um, I checked out YouTube for all those videos. You can do it, man. You can, if you can, if you got a computer, you can do a whole bunch of stuff. My iPhone is my best camera, but I got two more. I got iPads, I got the camera in my computer. So I was able to actually record a performance for the National Council for Traditional Arts, and it was part of their festival. I also recorded a performance for the Jazz Museum. And I could do this by setting up my scenes in OBS. I mean, you might not know what I'm talking about, but look it up, man. YouTube, you ain't got nothing else to do. <laughs> look it up. And, and There's always somebody that's going to really just lay it Look, try this, and you can stop the video and go back if you don't know what he's talking about. Got my NDI plugins. I can run into Zoom. I can do all kinds of stuff, man. And and I'd like to add to that. It's a it's a is a sense of power because, look, you're literally creating content that when people call and ask you, like, hey, yeah, can you perform? Sure. It's X amount of dollars, and you don't you can actually send them one of those videos. Tomorrow night we're doing an event. We're not doing the event, but they asked for footage, and their budget couldn't afford for us to actually go to a place and do it. So it's like, hey, would you accept this footage? Yeah, we'll accept this footage. Okay, well, look, I've just doubled my you know profit because I have content that's live and that you can get. So there's that whole thing too. You can literally, again, cut out the middleman, and you're creating content to sell as people need it, so. Yeah. And, and I think something that's important about everybody on this stage, who's not me at this moment, is creating something consistently. Every week, y'all are doing something to put something in the bank. And here's why that's important, because when we go back to normal, whatever the future is, you might go play a gig live, you have a chance to go play a show live, and somebody finds out, oh, that's the guy that did Funky Uncle, or that's Water Sea, or whatever the connection is, and they're gonna wanna know more. And then they're going to go look at your YouTube channel or your Facebook page, and you've got 52 weekly installments to give them a reward. Talk about hooked. Now you've got a fan for life. You've given them something really special. And as long as those live shows keep coming, they're going to show up for those, as well as going to see you live. So in that regard, I think it's, it's, it, it's not going away, as well as it's super important for musicians to think in these terms because you're creating a repository of stuff that, Somebody discovers you in the future, you're going to reward them with, with, with this effort. And you know, you can't imagine how interested your fans are when you do something with someone else. Like I was part of a, a, a Netflix filming. Oh, come at, 
we took a break. I put the phone on, said, hey, I'm doing this. We're rehearsing for this thing. Everybody's got their mask on. We're being careful. Here's my young blood on the piano. Play some blues for him, man. I'm just, you know, wherever you are. I couldn't make it home for 3 o'clock one day. I stopped in my car at Audubon Park and put my phone on the dash and played the banjo in the front seat and then gave him a tour of Audubon Park. But, I mean, it's not just your music because they want to know what, where does that music come from? Authenticity. And yeah. then there's the times when they've been watching online and they say, well, I'm coming into town Thanksgiving weekend. And I can't wait to come and sit in front of your porch and watch you live because they have this connection online. And then when they're there, it's like, wow, it's a completely different experience. So every now and then you're going to get the people who you, you, you're making lifelong fans. But also kudos to the people who do who are able to come out and, and, and God help you if they come out and sit and you're not doing a show because that's very disappointing, which is again, the idea of consistency and making sure that, that you're following through. And I, 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 I'm so proud of you, Don, when you say you've done over 200 some odd shows, um, that's incredible. I'm home. And it's it important, <laughs> it's important <laughs> to make sure that we are consistent in what we say we're gonna do and what we're doing. And to that, it does, look, three, four times a week, we get a message from somebody, when are you guys planning on coming to New Orleans? I'm like, well, well, you're not playing, but it's, but the idea again is that those fans are discovering you and they're like, hey, you know, this is amazing. I saw you online and I like this. When can I come and see you? So it's musicians out there, do us, just do it. Don't, don't think about it, just do it. You'll be surprised with the results. Well, you know, there's long been talk in the music industry about you know, true fans want to get to know the artist better than what the persona that they see on TV or hear on the radio. And so I love that, like, you, the Friday Night at Funky Uncles, y'all doing the interviews, and uh, Lou, y'all are doing, your band gets together, what, on Tuesdays and does, what do you call it? The, so it's, it's, it's Tuesdays now. We have a podcast. Uh, it's called We Good, though. We Good, though. Yeah, I've seen <laughs> it's, it. It's, yeah, it's like, called We Good. And it's, but like and you it, talked about, it's like your conversations in the van going to a gig. We really, is literally when we're on tour, we're number one out of our minds in, in the van. So we bring up all of these weird scenarios and we talk about everything. And, and so it, the concept is like this these are our personalities. You know, this is this guy is consistently this way, this lady. And so it just gives fans that moment to say, man, that was an interesting, interesting point of view that you had. And look, I get people all the time. I don't think their watches would say, I saw you guys and was like, wow, I haven't released any music, but people are still like listening. So now we release music. Uh, we, we, we release a new song every first and third Wednesday of the month with a video and our, we debut it on that show because so many people watch it every time we release it. And we're on show 33, not show, we're not, uh, we're, yeah, yeah, but. I, I don't leave them all up. I yeah, mean, we, we're, we're at 33, but it's been, we've had a few breaks like with a hurricane and stuff like that, but just we saw the same thing. It's been the most effective thing we've done because it's been so consistent and we've allowed, so, the podcast people go back they're listening to the 30 episodes before and all so it's like hey why not just do it it's making me think about you remember the tv show the monkeys i do we all have our own version of the monkeys now we got our own <laughs> tv shows i love it right. you know what That's i mean right. yeah. yeah well I, the one i think about is the grateful dead and the way that they basically nuked the artist fan relationship and how like you know, coming up in the 80s and being into the hair metal and stuff like that, there was a clear velvet rope between the stage and the audience. And you aspired to the bright lights and you thought this person is untouchable and up on this thing. But you go back to the Grateful Dead and there was no expectation that there was a difference between the band and the audience. They were looking to, to push that boundary. And, and, and now that's the expectation is that if I want to get a message to some high, you know, uh, positioned rock star, I can just tweet at them. And it's not unlikely that I'll get a response. That's a whole different paradigm. So what that says to me is that now you have an obligation as an artist to make sure that you're connecting with your audience at that level. And that becomes your core audience. That's your deadheads, you know? And then you want to, you know, your, 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 your core fans will become evangelists for you. If you Absolutely. Know. Happened to me yesterday. A guy wrote me from Germany. He just emailed, saw my website and emailed to me. So I answered him. And his answer coming back was, it's very unusual for an artist of your caliber to return an email so quickly. 
<laughs> you know, it's also very unusual for me to pay my energy bill, but and, <laughs> and, and now he's a fan for life. That's right. Well, yeah. Well, and I've long said that when I talk to artists, it's like, you know, what can you do to make that person a fan for life? You know, you give them some little insight or connection that is unique to them. They're going to be fans for life. Right. And um, wait, I think we got another question coming in. Let me see this. This might be our. I can get my phone to open up, recognize my face. Uh, the question is, regarding front porch shows, how serious is the $100 per person? Oh, $100 permit. Sorry. Are you, who's, who's dealt with the permit issue? I just got an email about it, so I'm yeah, looking into it. Happened. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. I'm looking into how that's going to translate into... Hey, do I need to go out get, get a permit like right now? Do I need, am I going to get shut down? I know there's a lot of talk about it in the community. Um, I am kind of flabbergasted that, that this is even a point. I suppose there are big enough port shows that may warrant, you know, I can, I can understand making sure safety is an issue. That is always the number one issue. But I cannot understand um, having a permit to do a show on your own porch, in your, on your own house. Well, you it's might difficult to understand. Bucks in the first place. Yeah, exactly. So I'm looking nope. into it. I don't know what's going to happen with that. I would say stay tuned because I know I'm a part of a number of conversations that are discussing that topic as well. And um, it is an issue. I mean, I understand certain aspects of it. But, you know, if you're not even going to make 100 bucks, why is it fair to have to charge 100 bucks? We're going to table that one for now. Oh. And we are running out of time. So, but I had one round with one question I want to ask each of you, um, and that is um, what a piece of advice would you give to someone who's struggling with virtual gigging, or what would you suggest to them the one thing that might improve their experience as a person that's trying to break into virtual gigging? If there's one thing, if it's invest a little bit of money in one piece of gear? Is it, how do I market to my fans better? Is it, you know, just one piece of outgoing, uh, you know, advice for them to take out into the world? Don, you're, you look like you're ready to give the first one. Consistency. All you need is your phone. Get in front, say, hey, I'm so-and-so. I'm here, man. I'm going to play a little bit for y'all. I hope you like it. If you want to send me a tip, you know, send it to me at Venmo. If you can't, that's okay. I'll see y'all. I'm going to do another one tomorrow. Have a regular time that you do it, too. That's it. Consistency. I would say keep it simple, especially if you're just starting out. Um, if you are a solo musician, you don't have to have a big band. Um, if you're a vocalist, start with, you know, just you, a duo. And keep it simple. Keep it uh, short and sweet, and give your best work in that uh, time that you are presenting. That way, you can make sure your fans come back to listen. Awesome, Chris. I would say don't expect it to be perfect right out the gate. Give yourself some room to grow into whatever your thing is, because the ultimate thing that's going to make you connect is authenticity. And if you let people know, hey, I'm learning how to do this too. That, then it kind of takes that judgment off the table. And then you're free to grow at your own pace to the quality that you expect. You don't have to come out blazing. You can make mistakes. It's totally, totally cool. As long as you keep progressing towards that vision, people will forgive you and enjoy the ride with you. That's the secret. Yeah, that's a great point. Lou? Everybody's taking my answers. I was going to say <laughs> uh, <laughs> consistency. And I was like, I got another one. But, you know, auth be authentic. Um, people will know when you're not. Don't worry about what the person to the left of you or the right of you, what they're doing. Be 100% you. If that's goofy, if that's geeky, if that's weird, there's an audience for everybody. Just be 100% authentic. You're not going to catch the person you're trying to mimic anyway. They're gone. So just be you and present that. Soul Stew, what you got? Yeah. Uh, I think everything that 
all these fine people just mentioned is, uh, is wonderful and uh, great advice. And I guess on that note, um, I, I think like personalizing it, you know, um, you know, the reason like people like myself and Chris got into this crazy business um, is because we love music. We're fans of it. And as a fan, not only do I love the music, I love the history and I love the stories behind it. And you got someone like Don who's been playing traditional jazz in New Orleans and much more for so many years. I like the cool stories he has are incredible, you know, and Anais, I mean, as well, and Lou, I mean, you guys are all such unique performers and people to see that kind of come across and to share a little bit about the, of that with the fans, I think, is a really cool touch, especially in a town like New Orleans, where we are in such a unique place where we can give people such cool content. Like Don telling you about giving them a tour of Audubon Park. I mean, that guy sitting there in New Zealand at like midnight, he saw that was probably beside himself. I mean, that's so cool. Where else are you going to see that? So I think that that personalized touch makes it, uh, makes it that much more unique and will kind of draw your, uh, your viewers in a little bit deeper. I think those are all great pieces of advice. I really appreciate it. And we appreciate all y'all for tuning in. Um, I think we could talk forever, you know, but I also understand Zoom fatigue and, and attention span and hearing people talk all day long. So um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up and give a big shout out to the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation for putting on Sync Up. Um, we hope that uh, we'll be able to get back to some, hopefully this will be the impetus to start us back up on a regular basis again. And um, until then, go ahead out there and give it a try, make some music, share it out on, you know, let us know when you're doing your first one and we'll try and tune in and um, y'all have a great evening. Thank you, Reed. Oh, wait, I got to thank all the panelists. Once again, Don Vappi, yeah. Anae St. John, Chris Finney, Lou Hill, Soul Stew Raper. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Reed. Thank, Thank you, you, Reed.